Oh God, you're my God, I seek you. Oh my soul, it longs for you. My flesh faints for you in this land, this dry land where there is no drink. I've looked upon you in this place, beholding.
Welcome to Houston Street Baptist Church. We're so glad you joined us for worship. Come on in. We're just getting things ready for you. Hey, welcome. If you didn't recognize it, we're here at 383 Houston Street. This is our old church building that we're going to be replacing. And uh, we just thought we'd show it to you, kind of a nostalgic look for old timers. And some of you have maybe have never even actually been in this building. So this is the old platform. In a couple of weeks, we'll be doing some shots from the new building. We're looking so forward to that. So anyway, thank you for being here today. And we're looking forward to what's going to happen in worship. I also want to thank you for sending in your pictures. We've enjoyed a few. We didn't get as many this week, kind of what you've been doing to survive 
the shutdown, playing games at home or crafts or whatever you've been doing, feel free to send in some more like that. We've also got a new project this week. The project this week is take a video of you singing your favorite worship songs. Maybe your family doing something together or uh, you as an individual, you can accompany yourself. Uh, you could sing along to a tape or something like that. Make it less than, a, more, no more than a minute, okay? But just sing a verse, sing the chorus of a favorite worship song. We thought that'd be fun to see before the service starts. So continue to help us by making this a really welcoming place. And if you've never been to Houston Street before, a very special welcome to you. Thank you for uh, signing in this morning and finding us here on the uh, internet. And we hope that you're going to really appreciate what God does among us as we worship together this morning. Uh, in order to connect with us during the week, we have several things that take place. We have prayer times. We've got a book club. Thursday nights especially is a time for all of us to gather who can. We call that Houston at Home. This week, it's going to be a prayer night. Come and be prayed for, pray with some other people, and just connect in that way. That happens every Thursday night. All of that can be found on our website. And I would just encourage you to go there, houston.ca. Find out all the information, how you connect into our Zoom calls and uh, to link into the things that are taking place uh, each week. And so encourage you that way. Oh, yeah, I want to remind you as well for children's ministry. Uh, Mrs. Crosby's put together an incredible curriculum for us. She sends out videos every week. You find that on the website. Our youth ministry goes on. Uh, Pastor Derek is continuing to invite the uh, youth every week in a variety of settings. Again, go to the website, houston.ca, and you'll find those things out. And this week, the uh, men are getting together at noon on Tuesday. That's happening every other Tuesday. And I uh, encourage you men, if you got time, to just connect in a special way with some of the other men of the church. That's a reminder for this week. And uh, this week, we're going to spend some time in prayer just before we get into our service. And there's a number of things that I want us to be praying for and just to make you aware of. The first is we're celebrating with the Jenkins. Paul and Susanna had a baby boy born on Tuesday, May 19th. Rory Kevin came into this world at seven pounds, nine ounces. And we are so thrilled uh, with them to be able to pray for them and uh, as they expand their family in this way. And I know you'll be praying for them as well. I also want to be giving thanks today for the Lord's financial provision for us as a church. We have just, well, as a staff, just each week we see offerings and see numbers. And we are just so thankful for how God has used you in uh, faithfulness to provide for us very well and a very stable uh, financial base that we've been able to experience. You've learned how to use the online giving, the e-transfers, uh, just dropping off of the church. And so thank you, church, for doing that and continue to uh, carry on that way. And then uh, a couple of other notes of news for you. Uh, this is the final Sunday that Michael and Tiffany Wong are going to be with us. It seems weird to be saying that because they're with us, but they're at home and we're all at our homes. But this Tuesday is their date for moving down to Boston. And uh, we have so appreciated their ministry uh, with us here and just getting to know them and the fellowship as a family. And as they've, they're making this huge transition for work, uh, we just want to be praying for them and letting them know of our love and our care for them as they make this transition. And one last bit of news. Many of you probably heard this week that Ravi Zacharias passed away. And this is an incredible uh, moment really for the church internationally. He had just such an incredible reputation around the world as an apologist, as a preacher, really as a lover of Jesus Christ and a proclaimer of the gospel. And uh, this past Tuesday, he passed away. And this morning, we just want to join the church around the world, praying for his wife and his children, his extended family. And so those are some notes that you'll want to be carrying with you this week. And I'm going to invite you now to just pray with me. And then after I pray, we'll enter into our worship service together. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that as we come together uh, through these unique moments on uh, the online medium, that our hearts unite and that you unite us by your spirit. 
I thank you for your gracious provision for us, that you continue to walk with us as a church family, and that we can know your goodness and your grace to us. And I give you praise for this as you demonstrate yourself as the great provider. I thank you, Father, for Rory that was born this past week. Pray for Paul and Susanna that you're gonna strengthen them as parents and that you will continue to unite and bind this family together. Father, I thank you for Michael and Tiffany and that we lift them up to you and pray for them as they make this uh, move down to Boston now and that you're gonna watch over them and walk every way with them. Father, lead them into another fellowship of believers as they make their home there. And may these coming years be for them just great times of growth, of maturity and fellowship. And Father, may we stay in their minds and hearts as they will stay in ours. And so bless them in all of these things. And finally, Father, I do pray for the family of Ravi Zacharias. God, we thank you for every memory we have of him, for the ministry that many of us have experienced through him, for his teaching, for his provoking us to deep thinking, for his proclamation of the gospel and of Jesus Christ and the assurance that we have of who he is, all of this through the mind of this wonderful individual. Father, we thank you that many have been able to see him in person. And uh, Father, we now lift up his family, that you are gonna bless them with your grace and your peace and guide them in these next days and coming months as they grieve his passing, but also, Father, treasure up his memory. And so, Father, bless them with your grace and with your peace. And now as we come together into worship, God, would you bring us through the words of songs we're gonna sing, through the preaching and proclamation of the message from uh, Derek this morning, that all of these things are gonna be used by you to bring us closer to you, that we might grow up into Christ in all things. And we give you thanks, amen. Yeah. 
the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Complete, still my lips shine. 
when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Good morning. Today's reading is from Colossians 1, verse 21 to 23. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, am a minister. Our reading today is Luke 24, 1 to 7. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and your children. And to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Where is it found? Acts 2, verse 38 to 39. Isaiah 53, 10 to 12 says this. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you
veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus here are the six things that I think are essential. The gospel is a plan from eternity. And I say that because when Paul articulated the gospel, he said, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, which means something before signified this is a plan. God set it up before it happened. That's number one. Number two is the gospel is an event in history. Christ died. Number three, the gospel is an achievement in and through that event of something that happened between the Son and the Father. Namely, sins were paid for and righteousness was completed. This was an obedience unto death and therefore a perfect obedience was achieved and a perfect guilt offering was paid. So that's number three, an achievement. Number four is that is extended in an offer to the world that is free. If the offer were not free, there would be no gospel. If it were by works instead of by faith, there would be no gospel. So there's a plan, there's an event, there is an achievement in that event, and then there's the free offer to faith alone, and then comes what we call application of the achievement. To me, they're not the same. God did something in history for me before I have any taste of it. But now, by faith, I am forgiven. And now, by faith, I am justified. And that's an essential part of the gospel. If those things don't happen to me, there's no good news at all. So there's the application of the achievement. That's where we usually stop. This is my concern, my own personal concern about the fullness. And I think the Gospel Coalition gets this, understands this. If we stop at forgiveness, just take forgiveness. If we stop at forgiveness and say to the world, we have good news for you. God made a plan. God sent his son. Christ died. Your forgiveness was achieved. It's offered freely. Take it by faith. Yes, you have it. And we stop, which we often do. Something's missing because I want to say, so what forgiven? And a lot of people might answer, well, I don't like a guilty conscience, or I don't like going to hell, or my family might be better if I could live as a forgiven person instead of a guilty person. Instead of saying, 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered once the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. The, the sixth piece of the gospel that I think is absolutely essential is that we're forgiven and we're justified to bring us to God. God is our treasure. God is the end. My forgiveness is not the end. My justification is not the end. My going to heaven and not having a sick body anymore is not the end. All of that is means. Means to what? Seeing him, knowing him, loving him, being satisfied in him, and him being more glorified in me because I'm now eternally satisfied in him.
Hey everybody, I'm excited to study God's word with you today as we dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 11. We've been walking through as a church uh, a series entitled Marks of a Healthy Church. And today what I want to talk about is how a healthy church needs to be centered on the gospel. That a mark of a healthy church is that it's gospel centered. So we're going to look at God's words through the Apostle Paul today as he uh, teaches the church in Corinth the importance of relying on and understanding the gospel in its fullness. So let's read God's word together and then we'll pray. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. Let's pray. God, we come before you and and acknowledge that without the work of the Spirit, we cannot understand your word fully. So I pray that you make us aware of the work of the Spirit in our lives today. Would you convict us and confirm us? Would you use this time together today to draw us closer into your presence? Would you make your word known to us as we study it? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So at the start of the service today, we were able to see some of the different ways that you have been passing time during this isolation, some of the different projects and things that you've been up to while we've been apart. And I gotta tell you, some of that stuff looks pretty exciting. And what I've been doing is not nearly as productive or as interesting. With my free time, I've mostly been watching television. But I will say that as the youth pastor of our church, I do consider it one of my responsibilities to stay up to date with the current culture and aware of what all the kids are watching on TV. And so really, I think uh, it's for the larger benefit of the health of, of our youth that I do watch some of that TV. And that's what I tell myself, you can do what you, with that what you will. But I have been watching TV, I've been studying culture, and there've been two shows that have really dominated uh, the attention lately. Tiger King and The Last Dance, which if you don't know, is the the documentary on Michael Jordan and the 1990 Chicago Bulls that that won so many championships. Both of these shows have just shattered records uh, for documentaries. The Last Dance is already ESPN's most watched documentary they've ever made. And if you combine uh, their channel and and Netflix internationally, there have already been, in just the five weeks that it's been out, there's already been around 30 million people who have watched that show. And and Tiger King's a whole nother uh, animal, pun intended, uh, on its own. Tiger King, within the first 10 days of its release, had, had already had 34 million viewers tune in for at least part of the show. And within a month, there were already over 60 million people who had tuned in to watch that show. But this trend in, in popularity towards documentaries isn't something new. In the summer of, of 2018, Time Magazine released an article talking about the, the increased popularity of documentaries and true crime podcasts. And there seems to be something that have have caught the attention of people about these these real life stories. And as I was thinking about that this week, I was just drawn to the fact that I think as people, we like to know uh, the heart of a person. We really like to know what makes somebody click. We like to know what's behind a community or an event that happened. And so we're drawn to these documentaries because we wanna see what's really at the center of the subject. What motivates them? What drives them? How do they act? How do they react to things? And you start to get a sense of of who they are by understanding what is at the center of who they are because that's really what pushes somebody forward. And so as a church and as Christians, we need to make sure 
that what's at the center of our lives, what's at the center of our church, what motivates us and empowers us and drives us, we need to make sure that at the center of who we are, we have the right thing. The great preacher Haddon Robinson uh, once said, what you are determines what you see and what you see determines what you do. What you see determines, sorry, what you are determines what you see and what you see determines what you do. And so as a church, we need to make sure that we are gospel centered, that it is the gospel of God that motivates us, shapes us, molds us and empowers us. And I think that's what Paul's getting at when he writes to the the church in Corinth here in in chapter 15. Just a little context for this letter. Um, Paul's writing this chapter as his, what we call like the great defense of the resurrection. And really what he's doing is he's writing uh, to explain the resurrection. And ultimately he's writing to explain the gospel to the church in Corinth because there had been some people there teaching that Christians aren't resurrected with a body. They, they, they weren't disbelieving that Jesus was re- resurrected, but they didn't believe that we as Christians would be resurrected. And Paul took that to mean that they didn't understand the fullness of the gospel. They got part of it, but they didn't understand all of it. And so he writes chapter 15 to explain the gospel and how the resurrection fits into that and shapes the church and the Christians there. So let's dive into this chapter together and, and really try to see what God is explaining through these words. Verse one, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And so right away, we start to see the importance of God's gospel as Paul is writing. Often, we are guilty, whether we mean to or not, of treating the gospel as the entryway into a relationship with God. We were sinners, and then by God's grace and the gospel work of Jesus Christ, we've been um, freed from our sins if we believe in in the gospel and we can have a relationship with God. And now we focus on that relationship with God and, and we try to grow. But that's not the picture that we see of the gospel being painted by Paul here. It's not just an entryway into Christianity. The gospel is Christianity. The gospel is what saves us from our sins. The gospel is how God redeems us and and how our sins are paid for and how we're brought into relationship with him through the gospel work of the cross. That's true, but it is more than just the beginning of our relationship with God. The gospel is what really allows us to stand. That's what Paul writes here. The gospel is what you've taken your stand on. It's the power of God's gospel that allows us to face trials. It's the power of the gospel that shapes us and, and sanctifies us. It's the power of the gospel that God, is a, that God brings redemption to us and the world around us. I heard a scholar say as I was doing research this week that uh, God uses the gospel uh, to have saved us from our sins to continue to save us by by sanctifying us and and shaping us into the people he created us to be. And he will save us through the gospel on the day of the Lord when we enter into his presence. It's past, present, and future tense. Leon Morris, when he's writing his commentary on on this passage that we're reading, he writes the fact that in in our English translation, it says that the Corinthians were saved through the gospel. But really, if you understand the Greek, what Paul's writing is, it's through the gospel that you are being saved. We are freed from the punishment of our sin. We are able to have a relationship with God now through what God has done and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But our salvation is not made complete until we are in God's presence. We are continuing to be saved. Perhaps the, one of the best things that COVID has done for us is, is to allow us to understand this, this ongoing process of salvation a little more clearly. You see, I love people. I love being around people. I love talking to people. I love meeting with our youth and having youth group and going out for lunch. I love hanging out with my friends. And so as the virus um, hit, hit our, our country and we started to hear these um, 
orders to self-isolate as families and, and not go in, into big groups together, I was terrified. I was devastated that I wouldn't be able to, to see the people I love and I care about uh, anymore. But then I got some good news. Through the internet, I was gonna still be able to connect with people. I was gonna still be able to, to see people's faces and, and talk to them from a distance and continue a relationship through things like Zoom and, and Instagram and, and FaceTime and, and Skype and whatever it is, we're able to still continue to encourage each other and worship each other in these new ways, although we're apart. And it's been great to still have some kind of connection. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited for the time where we get to, get, where we get to be together in person again where we get to be in the same room together singing praises to God, when we get to be in the same room together studying God's word, when I get to shake people's hands again. And if I'm that excited to meet with a bunch of people and a bunch of youth who are great people but can be a little annoying sometimes, if I'm that excited to be around people again, how much greater is it gonna be when I get to be in the presence of my God and my savior? I'm still able to connect with God through the work of the gospel. I can still pray to God. I can still worship God. But it's, it's not complete yet. It will be complete when I get to be in the presence of God. When I get to be there face to face in a whole new reality that outshines the beauty of the way I'm able to connect and communicate with God now. I'm saved, but I'm being saved, and I'm going to be saved that is the power of God's gospel. That is the work that God is doing in our lives through the gospel. So Paul's telling the, the Corinthians they need to remind themselves of the fullness of the gospel. To those people who don't believe in the resurrection, they don't understand the entirety of the gospel. To believe anything less than the full gospel is not to believe the gospel at all. To allow anything other than what God has done through the gospel, the work of Jesus Christ, and to allow uh, the Holy Spirit to shape our lives, to allow anything to be our center, is to believe in vain. N.T. Wright states, the only point in being a Christian at all is if this message, meaning the gospel, continues to be the solid ground on which you stand. As Paul says, the gospel is of first importance. So what is this gospel that is so important to us? Well, Paul begins to explain it. In verse three, we read, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul begins to paint the, the picture of the full gospel for the people in Corinth. Christ died for our sins. On the cross, Christ takes the punishment of humanity who have rebelled against God onto himself. When we look back at Genesis 3 and you look at the punishment of sin, the result of sin, the, the result of, of, the, of Adam and Eve who have rebelled against God and, and set themselves up to declare what's right and what's wrong and be their own masters, you see two things very clearly. When they rebelled against God, they brought death into their reality and when they rebelled against God, they were separated from God. They were removed from the garden, from the presence of God. And this is an understanding of sin that we continue to see throughout the scriptures. In, in ancient Judaism, on the Day of Atonement, when, um, when the people would, would seek to, to make right their sins from the past year with God and, and to atone for their sins, there were two goats that were used. The first goat is brought by the high priest into the Holy of Holies and, and sacrificed as a guilt offering to God. But the second goat is sent away into the wilderness. The punishment for sin is death and separation from God. And you can see that continue. And then when you look at the cross, you see, you see that Jesus fully pays for that punishment. He fully completes um, he, he fully completes uh, and pays for the punishment that we deserved. On the cross, Jesus takes all of the sin uh, from humanity onto himself, and he dies and is separated from God. And so Paul's explaining the gospel, and he doesn't just teach that Jesus died, but Jesus died for our sins. He died in our place. He took our punishment. 
And he continues. Jesus was buried and risen again. Paul emphasizes the fact that Jesus was buried. He was truly dead. He was really fully dead and buried. But he did not stay dead. Because Jesus had done nothing wrong, because he had no sin, the Father raised him back to life. Sin had been paid for. The devil had no power over him and death had been defeated. Jesus has been risen from the grave. Christ is raised in victory. He's raised in life. So what Paul's teaching is Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and the father raised him up in victory, in life, which is then given to us through faith and allows us to live in relationship with God. Amen. Both of these aspects of the gospel are absolutely critical. If Christ didn't die for our sins, then there's no forgiveness. And if Christ wasn't risen from the dead, then there is no life for us. We need to understand the fullness of the gospel. But there's more. Paul continues to preach the gospel as this chapter goes on. And it's a long chapter that I don't have time to, to, to fully read and dissect today. So I'm going to encourage you to read it on your own time. But if we look towards the end of the chapter and we go to, to verse 53, we, we read these words. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The gospel continues. Not only did Christ die for our sins to give us forgiveness, not only was he risen in victory and in life, but God brought Jesus back into heaven with him. Jesus ascended into heaven and he's coming back to fulfill the restoration process that has already begun. God is going to complete the work which is already being completed. When Christ returns... Death will fully be eliminated. Sin will be fully removed. And our relationship with the Savior and the Father will be completed. There will be no more brokenness anymore. That is the gospel that Paul reminds the Corinthians of. That is the gospel that is to be the foundation, the center of, of the Christians in Corinth and the church in Corinth. And it is important for us to be able to articulate and understand this gospel to make it the center of our lives and our churches as well. There are many ways that we can understand the gospel and communicate it. And the beauty of, of, of practicing how to communicate the gospel is that as we teach the gospel to other people and we seek to understand it and remind ourselves as it, of, of the gospel and teach ourselves the gospel again, we start to understand it in ways that we can never imagine. We just watched a video of John Piper explaining the fullness of the gospel in three and a half minutes. To be able to do something like that is, is incredible and it's something we should all be working towards because as we are able to do that, we start to understand the gospel better ourselves. I was saved, um, God saved me in high school through a, a day camp program and a, and a ministry program. And the summer after I was saved, I began to work at that day camp. And one of the parts of my job was to explain the gospel to, ch to the campers. And so what I would do is, is take the gospel that was being passed to me from my leaders and pass it on to the children. And as I had those conversations and explained the gospel to these campers, I started to understand the gospel in ways that I hadn't before, just by talking about it, communi communicating it, hearing their questions and thinking about the gospel more. And so one of the things we need to do as Christians is to continue to teach ourselves the gospel and practice on how to communicate it with the people around us, which God uses to grow our understanding of the gospel. So how do we do that? How do we work on that? Uh, I think one thing is it takes practice and I encourage the youth um, to practice this, to write out the gospel, to, to practice teaching the gospel to people. Um, and there's a couple different formats that you can use. Some people like the ABC method. I've heard um, Alistair Begg use that. He, he uses ABC as admit, believe, and come to God. Uh, I know some people like to use cradle cross crown or manger cross crown to explain um, God's gospel through the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, 
Some people love the, the old uh, five colors method. If you don't know any of these, you want to look up them or you want to contact me, I can, I can walk you through some of these. But I want to share with you today that the, one of the ways of explaining the gospel that I heard recently, uh, I was watching a video by Joe Solomon and he explains the gospel um, using four words. The first three, I think I've heard before, and I'm sure many of you have too. The fourth one was, was new in, in how I've heard somebody explain it before. So the four words that Joe Solomon used to explain the gospel were creation, fall, redemption, return. Creation, God created the world. He created it in his goodness. He created people to, to be in relationship with him, to be his people and, and obey him and, and follow him and to be in relationship with him. And then we have the fall that, that people rebelled against God and, and chose to be their own lords and decide what was right and what was wrong for themselves. But God didn't leave us in a fallen state. There, there is redemption. And God, through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, has uh, freed us from the, the pen penalty and separation from God that is the result of our sin. That through the, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, God has brought those who believe back into relationship with them and he's gifted them with the Holy Spirit as he sanctifies them and starts to recreate them into the people that he intended them to be. We have creation, we have fall, we have redemption, but then we have return. We have the promise that Jesus will return and when Jesus comes back, he's making God is making everything new, that there is full redemption, there's full restoration. Those who believe are brought back into full relationship with God and the effects of sin are gonna be removed. Creation, fall, redemption, return. This is the truth that needs to be at the center of who we are as Christians and who we are as a church. Paul continues to write, verse five, talking about the resurrection of Christ, he goes on to say, and that he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Paul goes on to detail the truth behind the gospel. He makes plain the work of Christ through the crucifixion and resurrection in the fact that Christ appeared to people in his resurrected body. This is the proof that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that God has accomplished what he promised he would accomplish. Jesus died and he's alive. Most of the witnesses that Paul's referencing, he says, are still alive. If you don't believe Paul, go and ask one of them. Don Carson writes in his book, The God Who Is There, he writes, the resurrection appearances are simply too frequent, too diverse, and supported by too many witnesses. The resurrection appearances are simply too frequent, too diverse, and supported by too many witnesses. They cannot be fake. He appeared to the disciples. Jesus appeared to the masses. He appeared to James, the half-brother of Christ. He even appeared to and saved a man who was persecuting the church, Paul himself. This is an event in history that truly happened. The gospel is real and trustworthy. God is saving his people. Verse nine, for I am the least of the apostles, not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul then details how the gospel has changed his life, how the gospel is at work in him, how it saved him from his sin, and how the gospel is saving him as God uses the gospel to transform him. Because of the gospel, Paul no longer opposes the church. He no longer persecutes those who believe. He no longer uh, attacks those who preach the gospel. No, he works for the church and he preaches the gospel of God himself. Through the continual saving work of the gospel, God has changed an unfit man 
into a person who proclaims the word and love of God. And Paul's very clear to say he hasn't worked hard to change his life. It is the grace of God with him through the gospel that Paul has been changed. The glory is God's, not Paul's. The work of the gospel is at work in Paul. It has changed him and it is changing him. And we can see it on display as Paul has made the gospel the center of who he is, as it motivates him and drives him, as God uses him and glorifies himself through the work of the gospel and the preaching of Paul. Verse 11, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. Paul ends the section here in verse 11 by saying there is only one gospel. The entirety of the gospel needs to be understood. The fullness of the gospel needs to be proclaimed. Whenever the gospel is preached, it needs to be the same gospel. Creation, fall, redemption, return. This is what we preach to ourselves and this is what we need to preach to other people. God saved us, he is saving us, and he will save us. That needs to be the very core of who we are and what we believe. And so what do we do with this idea of the gospel that is to be the center of our lives and our church? What does it actually look like for the gospel to be the center of the church? I think it means two very important things. It means we understand the gospel is of first importance in what we do and what we need. The gospel is of first importance in what we do and what we need. So how is the gospel of first importance in what we do? My first year on staff at Houston Street Baptist Church, we were celebrating, I believe it was the 130th anniversary of the church. As a family, we drove to the church and, and we all got out of the car and I had a moment of panic. I was wearing my hat, which wasn't actually weird. I normally wear my hat to church. But on this Sunday, I turned and said to Fiona, what if somebody's here celebrating this anniversary who's thinking about making a donation to the capital campaign and they see a staff member wearing a hat and they feel like that's disrespectful and they choose not to give to the church? I would feel terrible. And Fiona looked at me and said, I wouldn't really worry about it. And I said, yeah, you're right. It's not really that big a deal. And then she looked at me in the eyes and she said, no, you're just not that important. And she was right. If someone was thinking about making a, a pledge to the church, they're not gonna be swayed by the fact that I'm wearing a baseball cap. If, and more importantly, God's not gonna let my hat get in the way of his plans for his church and, and glorifying his name in the neighborhood and, and to, to the ends of the earth. I'm not that big a deal. And the gospel reminds us of the, the same thing. We aren't that important. Yes, we have important roles to play. God has equipped us and empowered us and we are to follow him and serve him. But it is God's gospel that changes lives, not us. As churches, we have all kinds of decisions to make on, on how to serve God and how to serve the church and how to serve the community. But the reality is the primary focus needs to be on how God is saving people and empowering people through the gospel. Our primary function is to make the gospel known and to watch as God does all the work. That doesn't mean all we do is preach, but if the gospel is of first important to what we do as a church, then it needs to be the root of our relationships with our community. It needs to be the root of the programs that we run. It needs to be the root of our worship. It needs to be the root of our preaching. We need to seek to make known in word and in deed the good news of God. We need to seek and make known God's gospel through Christ. We don't save lives. We are used by God to make his gospel known. The gospel, God is the one who saves through the gospel, not us. And it is the gospel that allows us to carry out the work that God has called us to do. It is the gospel that joins sinners together in the family of God. It is, the gospel, it is through the gospel that God saves uh, people from their sins. It is 
through the gospel that God allows us to have a relationship with him. It's, it's through the gospel that God has equipped us with the Holy Spirit to lead us and to sanctify us. It's through the gospel that we have the strength to stand against our, our culture and preach the truth and love of God. It's through the gospel of Christ that enable us to do what God has called us to do. We must seek to understand and live in the truth of the gospel as individuals and as a church and to let the gospel of God, to let God move us through the empowerment of the gospel as we understand that. So not only is the gospel the first importance in what we do, but it also needs to be the first importance in what we need. We need to understand that the gospel is the primary need of the people, both in the church and outside of the church. The gospel is how God shapes his people and how God rescues his people. It's how God makes us into the people that we were created to be. And this really works in, in two ways. The first is that on a broad scale, the gospel helps to address all of our problems that we have. I'm not saying that if you believe in Jesus Christ, all your problems go away. But what I am saying is as you understand the gospel and you believe in the gospel, you start to have a new view on life. You, have to, you start to have a new heart and a new way of understanding the problems that you are in. You start to see your problems in their proper light. Do you feel worthless? The gospel shows us our worth to the only being whose opinion truly matters and continues to exist for eternity? Do you feel lost like you have no purpose? The gospel reveals that your purpose is to love God, love others, and to share that love. The gospel allows you to live in your God-given purpose. Are you too proud? The gospel shows that you cannot save yourself. You are dead in your sins, just like everyone else in need of saving grace of the cross. Do you feel like you're unsavable? The gospel tells us that you've already been saved through the cross and resurrection of Jesus and you will be saved on his return. Do you feel like you are unlovable? The gospel shows how wrong you are. You are loved more than you will understand. Do you feel distant from God? The gospel shows us that God came to us because we couldn't come to him. Do you have trouble forgiving other people? The gospel reveals the extent to which you have been forgiven and it humbles you so that you are able to forgive. Do you fear death and what comes next? The gospel tells us that Jesus died so that we may live. Do you feel like you don't fit in? The gospel tells us that you were saved into the family of God to be in his presence. Do you feel like you don't have enough? The gospel tells us that Jesus gave everything so that we can have a relationship with God, which is what we truly need. Are you doubting your faith? The gospel tells us tells us that Jesus died for our sins, was resurrected, ascended, and will return. Those aren't ideas, those are facts. Are you bored in your faith? Let the love and awe of the gospel renew your joy in the Lord as you understand the depths of your salvation. And the list goes on and on and on. Understanding the gospel allows us to understand who God is and who we are. But it does more than that. Not only does it allow us to see our problems that we have in this life, it allows us to see and have our greatest problem solved. The gospel reveals in us our deepest need. We were created to be with God. We were created to be in the image of God but our sins have removed us from him and we face death. The gospel tells us that because of our sin, we can't be with God, but praise him. God gives us the gospel. God uses the gospel to come to us. Christ died for our sins. He was resurrected. He ascended to heaven and he will return. We are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. That changes everything. Our greatest problem, our separation and death from God is solved through the gospel. And this gospel of God needs to be the foundation of who we are as Christians and of the church. The gospel of God through Jesus Christ 
the gospel of God as we're sanctified through the Holy Spirit, the gospel of God that says he will redeem and is going to bring us back into his presence, that, is, that needs to be the center of who we are. A healthy church is a gospel-centered church. Amen. Let's worship together.
Break the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my
And so as you leave today, may you know the good news that God, through the accomplished work of Jesus Christ in the crucifixion and resurrection, and through the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, has saved us, is saving us, and will save us. It is the gospel that needs to be the center of who we are as Christians and as the church. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We're so glad that you decided to make Houston Street Baptist Church a part of your Sunday. And we pray every week that God would speak to our hearts in a unique way, perhaps through the music, through the word that gets spoken, through coming into God's presence together. And today, if God has spoken to you in some unique way, he's blessed your heart or he's raised a need in your life or maybe rubbed a burden a little bit raw, we would love to connect with you about that. You can do that through phoning the church office or checking uh, the email address. To find all that kind of information, I'll just go to the church website. I think it says main website up there in the corner there. Just click on that and you'll be able to find your way to our website, how to connect with us and contact us. And we would love to respond to you in that way. So until you come back to our church again, God bless and enjoy the rest of your Sunday.
Lord is gracious and slow to anger, rich in love he is, good to all. The Lord is gracious and slow to anger, rich in love he is, good to all. The Lord is gracious and slow to anger, rich in love. 